We'll be looking at heat and cold applications next um, for the CNA. So when we're looking at heat and cold applications, one of the things that I really want you to be careful about is making sure that you check the facility where you work. Um, every facility has its own policy as to what, you, what they want you to do and what they won't allow you to do. So always a good idea to know what your policy is about heat and cold applications. Now when it goes to applying heat or applying cold, um, they're used to promote healing and to promote comfort, but also to reduce tissue swelling. So for instance, if you sprain your ankle, generally we would put cold on that because that will decrease, it will constrict the blood vessels and decrease the swelling, the bleeding that's happening into the tissues. Where heat generally tends to be more of a comfort type of measure. Um, so we can use heat and cold to either promote healing, to promote comfort, to reduce tissue swelling, or to relieve pain. But again, I can't stress this enough, make sure at your facility where you work, you're allowed to apply them. Now, as far as heat goes, heat applications will usually dilate blood vessels. It's going to expand them to make them larger. So here's a picture of a normal artery right here in the middle. And when a heat is applied, the um, artery tends to expand, it gets bigger, and more blood flow can come through to the area. Where cold will do the opposite, cold will constrict a vessel, so less blood flow goes through it. So depending on what you're trying to accomplish as to whether heat or cold would be chosen. Now, your book talks about that if you do apply heat, if you leave it on for too long, it can actually constrict vessels and have a reverse effect. But for the purposes of, in general, how I want you to um, realize this is heat is going to cause dilatation of the blood vessels. It's going to dilate the blood vessels, expand them, make them larger, where cold is going to constrict them and make, make the um, passageway of the blood flow less. So complications of putting a heat application on is burns. Okay, we talked about, when we talked about the elderly person and their integumentary system, how it changes, we said they start losing some of that sensation, some of that ability for, uh, to be able to tell, you, to tell heat, cold, pain. So they may not notice it's too hot for them and that they're actually getting burns underneath the heat application. It can cause pain redness, blisters if it's left on too long. So we have to be very careful when we apply heat and we want to make sure when we do apply heat that when you put a heating device on a person, every five minutes you should go in and check underneath the heating device and make sure that it's not getting, you know, that it's not actually causing burning or blistering on their skin. And a heating device should be on for no more than 20 minutes max. Okay. So whether we use moist heat versus dry heat, Water or moist heat is going to conduct heat. It's going to make the heat work faster than a dry heat does. So hot packs, hot soaks, a sits bath. So what a sits bath is, is this is a sits bath device. And you, we use these a lot in a home care setting. Um, sometimes you'll see them um, after new moms have babies. Um, their perineal area is all swollen and sore and uncomfortable. And they can sit in this warm water. So what you do is you, we fill this bag up with warm water. It has a clamp on it to keep it from just running in. And then you open up the toilet seat and this, this bucket or this um, like basin kind of sits into the toilet seat. It has these holes back here so the extra water can just fall back here into the toilet so it's not just flowing all over the bathroom floor. And so the person sits in this and then you open up the clamp and just fresh warm water just keeps running over them. And it's, um, it makes it feel much cleaner and um, it's just kind of soothing and very comfortable for people. So people that have hemorrhoids or have had rectal surgery, um, maybe not right immediately after the surgery, they may not want it to get wet right then, but later down the road um, they might find this very comforting. People that have just had babies sometimes use it. Dry heat applications um, doesn't get quite as hot as fast. Um, and so sometimes higher temperatures are used to get the effect you want, like a heating pad, for instance. So you have to be careful, again, not to burn them or cause blistering because we're using too high of a heat. Now, cold on the other end, cold applications, we said, causes blood vessels to constrict, to narrow, to decrease blood flow to an area. Complications of using cold is pain, burns, and blisters again. 
And your book talks about a prolonged application can have a reverse effect, but again, I want you to learn heat as dilating blood vessels, cold as constricting blood vessels. Moist cold versus dry cold, of course, moist cold is going to get faster, quicker. Um, but cold compresses, cold packs, dry cold, an ice bag or an ice collar. Um, you know, a lot of people use frozen peas or frozen corn as an ice pack because it just molds to the area really well. Um, I had a physical therapist teach me one time to, to make my own ice packs. And you just take like a large gallon size um, Ziploc bag. And I usually do two just in case one gets punctured or the other one will catch it. And you put, I think it's... I think it's a half and half solution. I'd actually have to look up on the internet. It's been a while since I've made one, but it's like half um, rubbing alcohol, just a 70% rubbing alcohol and half water. And you put that in the bag and then you stick it in the freezer and it will freeze, but alcohol doesn't freeze all the way through. So it makes it kind of a slushy, um, it holds its shape, but it, but it molds really easy and they get really cold really fast. So um, it, it makes a beautiful, beautiful ice pack and cheap. You just got to be careful that you don't puncture the bags when you're throwing them in and out of the freezer, you know, to get recold again, that you don't bump up, you know, hit it up against other things so it tears open the bag. When we're applying heat or cold, we need to know the type of application and exactly where to apply it. How hot or how cold should that application be and how long to leave it on? Usually 15 minutes at a time, 20 minutes max. Okay, usually 20 minutes is the most we should, we should be leaving heat or cold on. Now, if a, a person, generally what most physical therapists will teach you is that you can, I mean, usually the doctor will order like ice packs three or four times a day. Well, you can do it more than that. You just can't have it on more than you have it off. So, for instance, you apply a heat, you, you apply cold pack on, and you put it on for 20 minutes. It needs to be off for at least 20 minutes before it goes back on again. So, you know, generally just, you know, keep that in mind. You can do them frequently, but you've got to make sure that they're off for at least as long as you had them on. Um, insulate the pad. So if you have a heating pad or a cold pack, you don't put it directly on the skin. You want to put a towel or wrap it up in a, um, a pillowcase, you know, and then put that on the body. Um, privacy, if you're putting this in an area where it's personal, you know, make sure again that we have the privacy curtain pulled or that we're providing privacy for the person. And as I mentioned, every five minutes we need to check underneath it to make sure it's not, you know, going numb, that it's not blistering, that, you know, that it's maybe not turning bluish or that they're shivering from it. So we need to recheck them. We need to make sure that their circulation to that area is still good, that they still have good pulses, good sensation, that it's not burning them underneath the, underneath the packs. The term hyperthermia. Hyperthermia means high temperature, okay, high body temperature. So usually we're referring to greater than 103 degrees. And that can be caused by illness, by dehydration, by being unable to perspire. You know, I have a girlfriend that has, um, she has a disease process and it actually keeps her from being able to perspire. She does not perspire at all. And I thought, oh my gosh, that must be amazing. I'm one of those people that I just have to think about exercising and I already start sweating before I've even done anything. So I feel like I'm an excessive perspirer. I thought, oh, it would be amazing not to perspire. But it's actually very, very dangerous because that's one of the ways your body gets rid of extra heat. And so when you can't perspire and you're sick and you're running a fever and your body can't get rid of any of that extra heat or you're trying to exercise and your body can't get rid of that extra heat, it's very, very dangerous and hyperthermia can happen. Um, the way we treat it is we've got to cool them down. So if they've got a high body temperature, we have got to get them cooled down. We have to, um, we can use, you know, cold packs, ice pads. We can use cooling blankets. In the hospital, we have these blankets um, that we have some of them that we can pipe air through the blanket and cold, you can pipe cold air through them. And we have some blankets that you can actually put fluid through it. You can put ice fluid through the blanket to really cool the body down quickly because it is dangerous to run a high fever like that for an extended period of time. Um, I thought this was cute, but it gave you the idea you could fry eggs on an electric blanket, but you know, when somebody's got a high temperature, when, when you're dealing with heating pads, you've got to be really careful with them because they do get really hot. Um, the term hypothermia, low body temperature, usually less than 95 degrees, um, can be caused by cold weather. Okay, I mean, when this can happen from cold weather, 
So usually we treat it by warming them up. And so these electric blankets, this is one that we use that you pump air through it and you can make it, if they have hyperthermia, high body temperature, we put cold air through it. If they have hypothermia, low body temperature, we can put warm air through it to help warm their entire body up. Um, so, and then we also have the type that you can run um, either hot or cold fluids through as well. And those work really well as well. But it is important when you have a temperature less than 95 degrees that we get that temperature back up. That can be very dangerous for the person. So just to kind of recap, heat is going to dilate the blood vessels. Cold is going to constrict the blood vessels. If you are using a heating pad or a cold pack, make sure you don't leave it on for more than 20 minutes. Put, it, put a barrier or a cover over the pack, you know, so it's not going directly on their skin. You know, make sure you're checking underneath it every five minutes. Um, and again, make sure your facility allows it, okay? And if you're patient, you know, you're doing vital signs and you're getting a really low temperature or a really high temperature, you make sure you let the nurse know right away, okay? You don't want to wait around on that and just to kind of watch it or see what happens or, oh, I must have taken that wrong. You need to let the nurse know, okay? So, so somebody's checking on that. And that will, will end this section right here.